originally for Passover. She did last weekend. And I'm like, no, it, it, it wasn't designed for Passover. She's like, but we eat it for Passover. We all have those recipes where they're attached to a certain holiday. All right, here's grape jelly meatballs. I've made this of more uh, functions of my writer's group. This is a really weird thing, yet it is extremely delicious. Um, so what you do is you have a cup of chili sauce and a 10 ounce jar of grape jelly and you heat those up together in the crock pot. And I usually put in like frozen turkey meatballs. Um, I have this recipe all over in church cookbooks. Um, and this particular picture is from Pillsbury Winter Classics, 1979. Okay. Uh, yes, grape jelly and chili sauce. Trust me, it works. It's like sweet and savory. And I, they, in a lot of the 1960s cookbooks, you'll see it with like little cocktail frankfurters, which of course were the height of elegance in a lot of the cookbooks. I don't know that people consider that. They're certainly tasty though. Uh, and they work really well with this sauce. Uh, so give this sauce a try. And um, what usually happens at my writer's group though, is that people be like, which thing did you bring? Because they're always afraid that I've brought some weird vintage thing. And often I have. So usually I'll lie and say I brought something else, which is fun. And then I'll see if they enjoy it or not. I mean, how else do I do research for these programs? All right. So crazy foods that shouldn't work, but do. How about bacon? Uh, and these are recent pictures. Um, I just, bacon has gone crazy. I mean, why? Why? I mean, it's good. My family loves bacon, but and here we see it with chocolate. You see that a lot or bacon chocolate uh, cupcakes that's sweet and savory. I don't know about the bacon toothpaste. I think there are limits. Uh, and the bacon roses, I would probably pass on. Oh, and the bacon candy canes. I, bacon and mint, I, ugh, no thank you. So that is not something that I think works well as an odd combination. But you know, everybody likes different flavors. All right, so Chex Mix. Chex cereal was introduced in 1888 by Ralston Purina. Uh, by 1952, recipes for Chex Party Mix appeared on boxes of Chex cereal, but it was not until 1985 that prepackaged products were introduced commercially by Ralston Purina and the trademark registered. And then it became popular as a holiday treat. So in 1955, the wife of a Ralston executive in St. Louis served the snack at a holiday function. And the first few years of that uh, snack being popular, it was shown like in cookbooks in these like these elegant glasses and stuff. This was like a really nice thing to have. Um, and from uh, from foodtimeline.org, people like to have it as a quote TV snack where you could eat without interrupting the television viewing, which is crazy to think about. Uh, yeah, nothing, uh, we're able to snack continuously in my house without worrying about the television viewing. But a few years ago, so the packaged ones came out in like 1985, like the ones you buy in the store now. And they've started combining a lot of weird flavors. And I found like a Chex Mix flavored with Sriracha recently. I remember Sriracha was hot like two years ago. And, but they have like spicy Chex Mix and there's a sweet Chex Mix. Um, so they're always trying to come up with new flavors. And I, you know, I think the original is probably the best on this one. Okay, pepper jelly. This was huge for years. I remember when I was younger, uh, everybody served this at parties. And while a lot of times it was holiday parties, you can certainly not make it into a tree, but, you know, form it, do it in the block and pour like pepper jelly over it. Uh, and it works really well. The hot-ish pepper jelly and the cool cream cheese work really well. Um, you want to make sure you have like thick crackers to endure that one. I bet some of you have had this one. This is one of my favorites. But then there's this one. <laughs> oh, this is a vintage cookbook favorite. Um, so originally it was called cheese in a can. That is, that is a marketing fail. Uh, I don't think that's appealing. Um, and so now for a while it was easy cheese, um, cheese whiz. Yeah, none of these names are fabulous, but they, they give us the idea. So there is a vintage ad for cheese whiz. And look at the suggestions they make. They even have them in thumbprint cookies at the top. Um, oh, it gets worse. I'm going to talk about Velveeta next. But processed cheese has like its own genre of cooking in the vintage cookbooks. So it was, it's, sold, it's sold by Kraft now, but it was originally invented by food scientist Edwin Traisman. Uh, and the, most sources think its debut was 1953, but they started seeing it on ads in late 1952. Um, so originally it came in a glass jar, like you see there, the cheese whiz, but then people realized it was so much fun to spray it in the aerosol form. Uh, it's hard to imagine in some of the things it has there. Look at the nice dinner with the baked potatoes or the thumbprint cookies. I'm just going to say no to that. 
All right, but how about Velveeta? Yeah, Velveeta has been around a really long time. You're gonna be astonished. And even if you don't wanna eat it in the fudge form, like I have pictured here, um, it, it, it is something that people recognize. So this one was invented in 1918 um, by a gentleman at the Monroe Cheese Company in Monroe, New York. Um, in 1923, it was incorporated into its own company and was sold to Kraft in 1927. Think about that, it's almost 100 years old since it's been at Kraft uh, and it's been around since more than 100. Um, it's, the name was intended to connote, uh, connotate a velvety, smooth, edible product. Yeah, I don't know. So I know a lot of people make this as a dip. They put squares of it in salsa in the microwave and then you know dip their crackers and chips and a lot of people do that Super Bowl time. But when I saw the fudge flavoring, I thought, oh my goodness. That is not something I've tried, uh, nor do I want to. So Velveeta fudge, we'll see how many of you want to do it. Yeah, nothing healthy about that one. Shrimpy pizza is the bigger picture on this page. I got it from a recipe book, uh, The Mothers Against Drunk Driving Cookbooks. You can still find those at like Resale or eBay or uh, antique malls, the ones that are open. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite recipes, but I had to laugh because there's a vintage form of it that is ridiculous. And there, that's the little picture. That's from... 500 tasty snacks where you're supposed to pipe cream cheese in between your different layers. That's ridiculous. You know, how much time you would spend on that. And then you cut that big wedge of it. You get all those flavors at once. And that's, and it included anchovy paste, shrimp spread, and salmon spread. Pretty sure salmon spread is nothing I want to eat, especially not in this form with all the flavors. But the shrimpy pizza is a wonderful appetizer. So I have this big round, uh, it's probably a quiche dish, and I put like a thick layer of softened cream cheese on the bottom. Then I put cocktail sauce on top of it and the de veined baby shrimp and then um, cheese. And sometimes if I want extra color, I'll put peppers or olives or onions on it, and that's it. You do need a thick durable cracker like Ritz or something like that to, so that you can spread the shrimpy pizza on there. It's amazing. Um, it is expensive to make that one, some of those ingredients, but it is unbelievably good. How about dandelion greens? This is Clara Canuccieri. Uh, she, for years, she's no longer with us, did a series called Cooking with Clara. Her grandson talked about the cooking she remembered from the Great Depression, and she has a book and things out, and she has, I think her YouTube videos are still up. So Clara um, lived in Chicago and worked at the Hostess Factory, and on her way home, she would pick dandelions for the family to eat for dinner. Imagine working with these luscious snack foods that you couldn't afford and then getting the dandelion greens, but she still liked dandelion greens even later in life um, and talked about how to clean and serve them. Um, and this is something my mother wants me to try again, and that is probably not going to happen. <laughs> A lot of people like them, though. All right, so strawberry salads. This is another one. This got to be popular about 10 years ago. We started seeing them in restaurants where all of a sudden salads had strawberry in it. And again, it's the sweet and savory combo. So now I don't think I've been to a shower in the last 10 years where somebody hasn't had a form of strawberry salad, sometimes with walnuts, sometimes with other kind of flavor combinations. Uh, it works really well, but it can be very simple and you still get the flavors in it. And then Green Goddess from the 1970s, those of us who are around in the 70s. Um, it is a salad dressing, according to Food Timeline, typically containing mayonnaise, sour cream, uh, different spices, including anchovy, tarragon, lemon juice, and pepper. Um, it has a whole bunch of different ones. Its origins, the most accepted theory, so a few places claim that they invented it, is that the Palace Hotel in San Francisco in 1923, that's when it goes back to, the chef wanted to pay tribute to an actor in a local play, uh, a hit play called The Green Goddess. Uh, and in the 70s, uh, salad dressing maker Seven Seas produced a bottled version. Now you can still get it. Um, I understand Trader Joe's has it. Uh, it's something that was extremely popular. Um, and the ad is a little strange uh, from the 70s, but uh, it's something we probably remember. Uh, and I think this is a fad that could come back. I could see people uh, playing around with this one and doing different things with it. Okay, this is the one my family calls the Thanksgiving salad. Okay, it is neither a salad, nor was it intended to be made for Thanksgiving. It was supposed to be a dessert for the summer, according to Jello propaganda. But uh, every time I mention this one on Twitter or whatever, all kinds of people are, oh, I make this, I make that. I recently saw a version of it in individual cups, which makes a lot more sense during COVID. 
Um, so they adapted the recipe some, but what you do with the 13 by nine pan is it's crushed pretzels and melted butter. Um, and you press it in the pan and bake it for a little bit. Now you could change that up if you were doing it in individual cups. But then you add a layer of Cool Whip and, and you add sugar, I kid you not. And then it has like jello, which uh, before it's completely hardened, you add the frozen strawberries and then you pour it over the top before it's completely gelled. Uh, this huge favorite of my family. And usually the whole pan is gone at Thanksgiving. And usually there's about 25 of us that come over. All right, everything goes with Jello, doesn't it? So I once had somebody at a program tell me that you haven't lived until you've had the crunchy Jello with the carrots. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> I know a lot of people who love it, though. That is the Sunshine Jello, or it's got different names. Uh, people absolutely love that one. It's like under the sea Jello. Uh, certain Jellos just, you know, evoke memories. I think for people, it's not always about the food. Um, as I've definitely learned giving these talks, or there wouldn't be so many people that like spam. Uh, it's the memories of the things that uh, that took place when those things were served. And so then we have uh, on the right is Cherry Cola Cooler. And that's from the amazing Marvello's Jello book. There was a Jello book in the 60s that had like magic tricks in it. It was supposed to be for kids. It's really charming. It's hard to get a copy of that one, but it has a uh, cherry cola jello, which was an actual flavor then, uh, made to look like a cola. But I put this in here because cherry cola was everywhere in recipes. Think of cherry cola cake uh, and the different floats and the things and the seven up cake. So there was a genre of soda in recipes too, and even with jello. This is from jello. I've got a lot of jello in here, but I promise there's other stuff. From 1973, it says you have everything for a cocktail party here. Um, take a look at this. Everybody has food in their hands and there's nothing missing from the table. So there might be another buffet table. That has always bothered me. So that's a side note. But they are having a topaz parfait. Um, the lovely lady in the striped dress is having it. Uh, and it has coffee, rum, brown sugar, and lemon jello that uh, are not flavor combinations that I want to try. I don't know that that one's delicious. That one might not go with the theme for tonight, but it was very popular to have alcohol in jellos. And then, of course, it gave way to uh, jello shots. Uh, but there are all kinds of parfaits. And they were jello was trying to show that they weren't just for dessert. They were elegant. There's meat jello recipes. There's all kinds of crazy jello recipes. Um, and in this case, they're trying to show its cocktail party. And I'm not sure that's successful. All right, this is a pistachio pudding. Uh, it was one of the main ingredients in both Watergate salad and cake. Uh, so the salad on the left has been known in a variety of different forms ever since the 50s. I've seen it as frozen fruit salad. Um, I've seen it at family gatherings as Hawaiian jello. It's usually got pineapple, uh, maraschino cherries, um, you know, marshmallows. It's not a salad. It's like the strawberry jello salad, not really a salad. But also when pistachio pudding came out, it was made into this form. Uh, it was, people called it Watergate salad among other forms of it. And then there was also Watergate cake. And the reason those got their names is it said people, according to the food timeline, which is the source I love, that the uh, people were talking about the scandal when these things were served at parties. So it's right around that era. Imagine what foods would be called now, right? So I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess about some current events. Um, so we have Watergate salad and cake, and it's really good. And you think, oh, I missed it. It's not, it is around. It's just got other names now. So those are the ones that were popular in the 70s. Okay, this looks horrific. I know it does. This is creamed onions. So my mother, um, after attending some of my shows, remembered uh, that my mother, my grandma made pearl onions uh, for Thanksgiving, and I could not find a recipe that worked. It just, none of it was good. So I found this in the red and white checked Betty Cracker book. Uh, this is creamed onions, and it looks terrible. That's ketchup. Ketchup and honey and butter. And I know those of you at home are going like, oh, no, no. You know what? It was fabulous. This recipe is going to be in your packet. It was so good. It was like caramelized. It looked terrific. There is no question about that. But my aunt was calling me afterwards for the recipe and asking me what was in there. Um, you know, there are some recipes that just work that way. And that it's like the theme of this show. And those were really good. All right. How about French fries? What do French fries go with? Here are some unusual things that were tried. 
Um, French fries and gravy. I see loaded French fries at all kinds of events now, not just food truck and fair food. You can order it. Um, a lot of people put French fries in their Frosties, that kind of uh, sweet and savory kind of thing again. And I've also seen them on burgers. Do you like to do anything unusual or different with your French fries? And how about the marshmallows on sweet potatoes? It used to be considered that this was crazy and this was something only like people who weren't very classy did until Julia Child said that was her favorite way to do sweet potatoes for Thanksgiving. Now, she didn't do it in this very elegant arrangement that we have here that's only lightly toasted. Uh, hers was very simple. She just put them under the broiler uh, she did not worry about be them being fancy. She just knew that they were very tasty. And you do find it in that cookbook that I have shown there. So I don't know if that's something some of you like for Thanksgiving. I've never been able to get my family into the marshmallow topping of it. Um, so, and here's what Julia Child said. She said, this old fashioned juvenile topping is held in such low esteem that none of the standard American cookbooks I have on hand even mention it. Of course, then she made her own marshmallows to go on it, which is way too much work for that holiday, but uh, she did it there. One of my family's favorite, it's super easy, yams and apples for Thanksgiving. Um, and I do it from the cans because I usually forget to buy yams until they're all out. So then I get a couple cans and I drain them and I slice the yams and I slice some apples and you layer them with brown sugar and melted butter and nutmeg in a pan and you just bake it for a little bit. That one will be in your packet. Super easy side dish. Uh, that one goes fast. Here's kind of an unusual one I saw. You know, you think of those like that old snack, ants on a log, where it was like peanut butter and raisins. Here's kind of a weird version of it. This is from the 1980 Toll House Heritage Cookbook I have, which was like a gift shop one from the Toll House Inn where the cookies were invented. Um, so you're supposed to take a peanut butter, raisins, chocolate chips, and honey, and put them in the middle of apple slices as your snack. Uh, and I bet those flavors work pretty well. Um, I think you could probably use it as a dip. You might not have to try to get it in the center of all those apples. That is a lot of work for no good reason, which is in a lot of these cookbooks. Here's other variations on the ants on a log. <laughs> I love the heart cut out of the apple slices or the butterfly celery. That's something a little different. Maybe younger people would like that too. And one of my favorite combos is apple pie and cheese. And people in my family ate this for breakfast. Uh, so I know people think, oh, cheese on apple pie, it's weird. This is, try it. Try cheddar on apple pie and warm it up. It's quite good. Uh, and it doesn't have to be something where you make all the pieces. It's really good. So from, uh, and I forget which, I don't know which, oh, this is food timeline. Okay. The practice of combining cheese, fruit, and nuts dates back to ancient times. These were often served at the end of a meal because they were thought to aid in digestion. Uh, from the earliest days through the Renaissance, the partaking of these foods was generally considered a privilege of the wealthy. That's crazy to think about. The practice was continued by wealthy di dinners composed of many courses until the 19th century. Apples and cheese making were introduced to the New World by European settlers. So it is popular in this country, and now we know where it kind of came from. If you haven't tried it before, give it a chance. How about pancakes for dinner? a few versions of it. The 21st Pillsbury Bake Off top prize in the convenience mix division. They always have some crazy product they're trying to sell. So that's what that one is. The Denver breakfast, uh, Denver sandwich ring. And I made it there. So it's got chunks of ham, pepper, uh, onion in it. And I think it used Bisquick. Oh no, it used Pillsbury Hungry Jack buttermilk or extra lights pancake and waffle mix. They're always trying to get people to use products in those Pillsbury Bake Offs. You know what? It was quite good. I don't know why it had to be formed into a ring, though, frankly. Um, I, I guess for appearance, uh, although, you know, that isn't the height of elegance there. But so, all right, on the left is from my Southern Heritage, Southern Living uh, Cooking Series. And that is stacked uh, pancakes with apple sauce in between them. And then you can slice them like a cake. And it talked about how certain areas of the country, the one on top is the slice, uh, the one on the bottom is cake. Uh, the, like the stacking, it said, was popular in Appalachia. And that's where a lot of the strawberries and uh, sh strawberry shortcake, that kind of idea came from with the stacking. 
I'm not certain that's a, a lot of these, there's a lot of food folklore too, uh, which is fun. So here we have biscuits and more. So the original, uh, like I said, it says in the Southern Heritage books that the strawberry shortcake a lot of times came from biscuits and then they would uh, pile it up uh, into even higher layers. Um, it's, it's good that way. If you haven't tried it, it's like a form of pancakes. That's what it tastes like. Um, all right, so biscuits and more. So biscuits and gravy, we know is a popular Southern breakfast dish. And for a while there, they had Lay's potato chips and, and the biscuits and gravy flavor it was awful. You know how they come out with those chips flavors every year? I used to do a program with the teens called Tasters where I would serve uh, like a food like chips or bread or cereal on as many different odd flavors as I could get. And they were supposed to have one bite of each and then vote on them. Um, and that was, our rule was please don't get sick uh, for that program, but it was very popular. I don't know about those potato chips though. So we talked about how there was like a Velveeta cuisine. Um, there is also corn chip cuisine in a lot of the church cookbooks from the 60s and 70s. Um, where you will see cereals made into a variety of unusual ways. And one is mixed in with meatballs, or the meatballs are dipped in the corn chip mixture. Uh, and some of these flavor combinations work. Uh, it's just odd. Um, here is the recipe for this one. It's beaten egg, a quarter of a cup of fine dry breadcrumbs, uh, one tablespoon prepared mustard, salt, pepper, ground beef, liver spread, Ooh. Uh, two cups of crushed corn chips and one six ounce container of frozen avocado dip. I don't uh, want to know where that's going, actually. And I think we can see it there. Um, so it is hard to imagine this one working. More cornflake cuisine. So this one, a uh, sleepy head brunch kebabs, and we can see it there. It used honey, lemon juice, cornflakes milk, egg, onion, mustard, salt, uh, sausage, one can of luncheon meat, you know what that is, uh, and shaved ham slices and assorted fruits well drained. Yeah, there's another one where we might not want to see how those are put together. I was with them until the luncheon meat and the fruit, uh, but kebabs, you think they're making meatballs and adding fruit and then cooking it that way, and probably some of those flavors work together. Wheels of dinner um, from the Better Homes and Gardens casserole cookbook. Here is a chili con weenie. The caption on the one on the bottom is for last minute supper, spoon hearty chili con weenie over toasty bun halves. Okay, it's a lot of hot dog art in the vintage cookbooks. The crown roast of hot dogs is my absolute favorite. But then there was a, a whole era where people did things that looked like wheels. And there was like Western and chuck wagon references. The one at the top is my version of the chuck wagon um, casserole. And you know what? It was quite good. It's like pancake mix with sausage in it. Uh, mine sure didn't. I, you know what? I didn't have the uh, links. I only had the patties, which doesn't look like anything good. But it turned out to be quite tasty. But I did not make it artistic like the one on the bottom. Oh, of course, we have to talk about spam. So spam is the brunt of many jokes, but the canned ham product, according to their uh, Hormel website, is deeply rooted in American history. And my family has been to the Spam Museum, uh, and it, uh, it was created by the Hormel company in 1937 and helped feed the world during World War II, and that's true. A lot of the world was starving, suddenly we've got this canned ham. Uh, and it helped so many different countries. And we know that it was very popular in Hawaii. A lot of people ate it. It's still popular in Hawaii. Um, they also had like the Hormel girls like drum corps where the girls would go around performing uh, and somehow promoting spam. So there was like no marketing thing left unturned for them. But spam is still going strong. Uh, in addition to the museum, which is a whole strange experience, they have contests on their website and recipes and there's Spam Sushi at the bottom. I get a kick out of that. They have all kinds of flavors of Spam. Uh, look at this. We've got like chorizo Spam, uh, jalapeno Spam. Uh, if you like Spam, you got to check out the uh, Hormel Company website and see. So 70 years helped feed the world. And the nutritional stats are, no, I'm not going to read it. It's got an awful lot of salt. Go for one of the lower salt uh, versions. So some of the, the recipes they've had were hot and spicy, the spam spread, 
that you put on your uh yeah we can imagine that spam oven roasted turkey spam hickory smoked i came home from the museum with teriyaki spam which uh was not good <laughs> now i've served spam at some of my talks when i did them live at libraries the world war ii foods and people all say they want spam or they might have nice memories of it very few people ate it i put like a cube of it on a plate for them this is from carnation team times cookbooks uh, cookbooks in the 50s prior to the 50s were aimed at adults uh and really before that time there were children and then there were adults there wasn't really like a teen age group because they went to work or they went to war uh, prior to that um, but suddenly now in the 50s we have teenagers and they have part-time jobs and suddenly they have money to spend so now there's teen cookbooks and the uh, carnation teen time is just one of my favorite it's got so many strange suggestions it says next time you're a guest remember your own party the hostess has gone to a great deal of time and effort to make the evening enjoyable do your part by appearing at your most attractive and pleasant self um look at those gowns and so you think oh wow this has got to be nice what is she making she's making the food that i have in the background which is called supper on a bread slice and that is the polite term for it people during war times had a much different name on it that had the word shingle in it um, and what they suggest here is to shred the luncheon meat into a bowl before you season it and put it on your um, bread it's strange to imagine the people in these adorable vintage gowns eating that particular item a lot of people think it's tasty the bread on a, a sup or meat on a bread slice and it would be depending on the meat you use and how you season it okay how about peanut butter and banana a favorite of the king um and you know definitely not healthy but if you haven't had this one in a while you might want to try it it's pretty good um i have multiple elvis cookbooks because i'm a huge fan um, my husband and i were at uh, graceland many times um and what happened at the library is that whenever someone would donate a weird Elvis cookbook, which seemed to happen pretty often, um, it would end up on my desk. <laughs> so I couldn't get rid of them. I would try to put them back down the donation, then I'd get more. So what I learned was the traditional peanut butter and banana, you're supposed to put a huge amount of butter on the outside of the slices, then you grill this up. You know what? You don't have to do that. I eat this sometimes now. I just toast the bread, then I put the peanut butter on while it's still like hot and then add some banana to it. So it's a nice fun snack and not too hard to do. People also like fried bologna and chips in a sandwich and that is the chips in the sandwich. Uh, this comes up in a lot of my Southern cookbooks um, from southernplate.com. They also have liverwurst and cream cheese and olive sandwiches. Um, so there's a fried bologna one on the right too, but also has egg in it. Um, I've put chips in sandwich, you know, think of like the fries and the burger. Um, some people like that extra texture um, or the salt flavor. And we know peanut butter and jelly has been popular for forever. Um, so the 1920s and 30s commercial brands of peanut butter, such as Peter Pan and Skippy, were introduced. And from What's Cooking America, it says peanut butter and jelly were on the U.S. military ration menus in World War II. It is said that American soldiers added jelly to their peanut butter to make it more palatable. So it was inexpensive and a high protein alternative for the soldiers. So it was a big hit. And then they came back here and had it. And it was within the ration books, too. And I just put some funny things on there like the socks and the huge, the soldier eating the huge amount. Um, but look at the pancakes. That's from a recent uh, restaurant that we had been eating in. So peanut butter and jelly pancakes, you know, it might be good. The combo works. So how about cream cheese and jelly? And here is it, it is in different versions of some in roll-up dessert, uh, some with uh, different flavors of jelly, uh, including like uh, apple jelly. And so I don't you know, know but how that would work. But if you think about it, we talked about it with the pepper jelly earlier, but it is a favorite with uh, strawberry. So it's like strawberries and cream. And of course we have the Fluffernutter, favorite of my husband. Uh, so the Fluffernutter cookbook from 1961 uh, had the Fluffernutter shake. So not just for sandwiches. So if you wanna make the shake, it says, put a generous spoonful or two of marshmallow fluff in the blender. Add two tablespoons of peanut butter and a cup of chilled milk. Blend until all ingredients are mixed or smooth. That, uh, that's, I don't know if I want to try that one. 
So the Fluffernutter sandwich, and from Yankee Magazine, the Fluff and Fluffernutter stands for Marshmallow Fluff, our preferred local brand of thick and gooey marshmallow cream. The marshmallow cream concept um, from the Encyclopedia of Sandwiches is, was a spreadable concoction of melted marshmallows and corn syrup. Uh, and has been around since 1917. It was in the 60s that they started advertising it with the pepper uh, peanut butter and calling it the fluffer nutter. That one seems to have people who either love it or hate it. Here's the sandwich loaf. So those of you who are into vintage recipes know this is a classic. Uh, savory foods formed into a cake. So it's bread cut the opposite way than we would expect it. And it has like fillings like chicken salad or tuna salad or egg salad. And then the whole thing is covered with a thick layer of cream cheese. I think I have this in all of my vintage cookbooks from the 19th, from the late 50s to the early 60s. It shows up in the Betty Crocker kids thing for how kids can make their own sandwich loaf. Uh, all kinds of versions of it. And you see they try different things here. Bottom one is dyed for a baby shower. Um, they've decorated it with flowers in the middle. And they've, I don't know what they've done with that top one. That's not attractive. <laughs> so I've had many people tell me that they had to make a sandwich loaf to pass their high school home economics. Uh, it's hard to imagine. Okay. So from the 1958 Hamburger and Hot Dogs book, uh, look at that photo. There's nothing appetizing about that one. That would never be on a cover of anything today because it's raw, you know, and that was popular and that was the times, but it isn't now. But what comes up a lot is how to make the frosted meatloaf. So you've got your meatloaf and you've got mashed potatoes over the top of it and you're cooking it that way. Uh, and you see this a lot. You see, it, it looks like the sandwich loaf. It looks like a cake but it doesn't cook all the way through when you've got all that in there. Maybe yours will look like the one that's pictured on the right and that's not appetizing. So here's the directions. When the loaf is baked, pour off all the juices. Wow. Thickly, and then you can put the stuff, the potatoes on it then, and then stick it in the broiler. Uh, and then it says sometimes you can add Velveeta, of course, because you know you can't eat it without the Velveeta. All right, chicken and waffles. Uh, this is, again, a very popular from PBS History Kitchen. It says, the earliest American chicken and waffle combination appears in the Pennsylvania Dutch country during the 1600s when home cooks made waffles and topped them with pulled chicken and gravy. If you haven't had this before, it is fabulous. Another sweet and savory. I know IHOP and other places serve it. Um, there's been throwdowns with this on the Food Network with Bobby Flay. This is a fun treat. And how about Hawaiian pizza? People either love this or hate this. Um, I like it, but only with sliced ham and not with the canned spam. Uh, so this is not a Hawaiian invention. It actually came from Canada. Uh, the Village Voice, National Post, Toronto Sun, and Chatham Daily News have covered the claim that someone uh, created the first Hawaiian pizza in Ontario, 1962. So it was a co-owner of the restaurant and he would build on it with like probably Canadian bacon. That's probably what was on it originally. And then um, it's got a sweeter sauce and pineapple. It's pretty good. I, I'm one of the fans on that one. Okay, I don't think you can have a church or community cookbook without spaghetti hamburger or taco pie. Open yours up to any page and you'll probably find one of these variations. So what these usually are is, uh, you know, just, regular popular foods served in a casserole or a pie version. Uh, the bottom one has crushed corn chips on it on the taco pie. Uh, I see so many of that hamburger casserole in the middle with the biscuits. Usually part of mine doesn't get cooked when I do that. Either the biscuits don't get cooked or the, uh, the casserole inside. And then there's the spaghetti one where you make the spaghetti, make sure it has enough egg or something in it so then you could make it into a pie. I've done versions of that. You can cut it into wedges. That's kind of fun. And how about s'mores? So s'mores are making a big comeback and I know that's fuzzy and I apologize, but I've seen s'mores buffets at weddings now, or you know, when we were able to go do those things. Now we couldn't do this. You'd get a bag of how to make your own s'more at home, which actually would work for me. I would be happy to do that. So s'mores appears to be a contraction of the phrase some more. The first published recipe for a s'more is found in a book of recipes published by the Campfire Marshmallow Company in the early 1920s. 
when it was called a graham cracker sandwich. So it was popular with the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts also. So, uh, you know, you see different versions of it, uh, but the, of course they want to claim it, the Campfire Girls. And you could see how that would happen. People would combine the marshmallow and add the chocolate. It'd be fun to have a bar a buffet with different types of things. I have a cookbook that's all s'mores and they don't just count like the graham crackers. They use like angel food cake slices and then they have like strawberry and um, different combinations in there. So it doesn't always have to be uh, chocolate and marshmallow. Oh, that is very good. How about spicy chocolate? This is huge right now. Chocolate peppers. Um, for a while there, Milano had a chocolate chili. Um, there's spicy, uh, Sonic tried spicy chocolate drinks for a while. You can find lint chili chocolate in Walgreens. A lot of people like the spicy chocolate with a little bit of a kick in it. It's considered like a gourmet flavor. Uh, I, I don't think I've cooked anything with it. I'm not as big on the spicy, but my teen son absolutely is. I don't know if you're a fan. So chocolate and fruit uh, works in a variety of combinations. I once had a session of tasters where we did chocolate and I had fruits in there and they said I cheated because <laughs> it wasn't all chocolate. I'm like, it's still chocolate. We're trying it with fruit. We're allowed to have fruit at this. I used to have adults asking me to teach uh, adult tasters too. It was a lot of fun. It's hard to imagine a program like that going now uh, with the COVID, but um, so we know that uh, cherry cordials were extremely popular. Um, Lorraine LaRusso was the creator of chocolate-covered strawberries during the 1960s. She introduced them at a store called Stop and Shop in Chicago. Uh, and CandyFavorites.com uh, said at the same time there were chocolate-covered cherries. So probably these have been around in different forms before that. Um, think of Fannie Mae and all the different fruits and things they have. So what's your favorite? Uh, chocolate covered strawberries are great, considered elegant. If any of you have been up to the Long Grove Chocolate Festival or some of the ones down by you guys, you know that some of those different chocolate flavored treats are a lot of fun, the different fruits. How about sea salt caramel? That certainly has taken everything by storm. I It used to just be seasonal too. You just used to see the stuff in the fall, but now it's everywhere. The sea salt caramel doves are among my favorites, but they're also some really good combinations. Some don't work as well. The Hostess Cupcakes tried to do sea salt caramel for a while and I, you know, I don't see the point. And really it didn't taste like sea salt caramel. Um, but they, a lot of places have tried different things. I've seen it in popcorn. I've seen sea salt caramel in just about every food flavor imaginable. Um, and I think in 1998, the San Francisco chocolate maker Michael Rishuti was selling his own Flor de Sel caramels, covered in chocolate. So that was one of the first times where they were kind of considered to be gourmet. By 2000, pastry chefs at top New York restaurants had fallen completely in love with the way an extra hint of salt can enhance something sweet. So they would serve it, uh, the sea salt. And now I see it like in donut forms. I'm trying to think of dessert that I haven't seen in sea salt caramel, it's hard to imagine. We know in the 1960s that Cherry's Jubilee was very popular and there's like a whole genre of chafing dish foods. Uh, and there's a reason that didn't catch on, literally, right? It was uh, dangerous. And chafing dish cooking. I have all kinds of cookbooks from that era that are like wok fondue and chafing dish. Uh, so crepes uh, was another flaming crepes was very popular. Um, I remember once I had a reference desk at the library and they, they sent someone down to me and they said, all right, well, we want to know how to do flaming foods. And they were interested in doing a cake. And I'm like, well, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this and this. And they're like, you didn't look that up. I'm like, no. I have so much crazy food knowledge in my head. Uh, it is kind of scary. How about zucchini bread? Zucchini chocolate bread is very popular. My son is a huge gardener, my tween. Uh, so, so zucchini bread, um, and think that this is not that much different from like carrot cake and other things. People use it as a sweetener, moisturizer, um, but it's really taken over. You do not see this as much as vintage, but it has been around, um, it didn't catch on as much in the vintage cookbooks. I didn't see it. And I was kind of surprised because think of the carrot jello, but you do see it starting from the 90s and on. You see tons of like zucchini breads, zucchini chocolate bread, um, and easy because zucchinis are easy to grow and you can freeze them and you can make them into all kinds of things later. 
And then there's carrot cake with this wonderful 1970s photo from, uh, it's from one of the Bake Off cookbooks. Uh, and we know it's from the 70s because of so much orange in it, right? All the kitchen photos from that era are avocado green and orange. Um, so there's a website called the Carrot Cake Lady where she talks about the history of all this. I'm not making fun. That's no different from my interest in it. Uh, and so it says carrot cakes have, carrots have been used in sweet cakes since the medieval period, during which time sweeteners were scarce and expensive carrots uh, contain more sugar than other vegetables. So they do show up during hard times. They came up during rationing. Carrot cake was popular in the 70s um, when people were struggling. And then, you know, it really, it's been around since spice cakes have. And spice cake in some form or another has been around since people were traveling around the earth for spices and selling and trading them. So as long as carrots have been around, people were using it as a sweetener. Um, people also used beets as a sweetener. I have a friend who makes a uh, devil's food cake only with beets and she says they're moist uh, and delicious. And I will take her word for that. Many of you may have the Campbell's cookbook. This is a popular one among collectors. Um, from my 1972 printing, I have a tomato soup cake, and this is delicious. I've had this, it's like spice cake or gingerbread cake. Um, you're supposed to make it with uh, two, 300 strokes of the arm instead of a mixer. Uh, that's a way to wake up, work off your cake before you eat it, I think. But no, I use a mixer because <laughs> that's what it's for. Um, so it, it's really good. It's just like spice cake. It seems like it would be odd, but it isn't. You can certainly look that up online if you don't. I might have included that one in the packet. I think I've got one more slide before we take some questions. Uh, so my grandma Curtin made mashed potato donuts. Uh, that was my mom's mom. And are there any variations of recipes you have that have something kind of unusual that people might not expect in that? And so I hope you've been thinking about that while I've been talking about some of these. And uh, I'm looking forward to answering your questions. I don't know if I can see them.